Welcome to the third module, part two of our digital neonatal nursing course. My name is Margarita Singa, and I'm the regional marketing manager for Draeger for neonatal care. I'm also the global trainer for Draeger for neonatal ventilation and thermoregulation. So today is our fourth webinar of the series, and I would like to welcome you all. I'm very glad to see some of you coming back to the second to the third webinar and of course i would like to welcome everyone who is dialing in for the first time so during today's webinar we are going to have a presentation with extremely knowledgeable and experienced um clinician uh linda miss linda pretoris uh she's a neonatal uh, she's a neonatal nurse from south africa she has a diverse experience and very in-depth knowledge in the topics such as developmental care, the care for extremely low birth weight, uh, premature infants. She is a developmental care consultant in South Africa. And uh, so today we're going to be uh, recapping on the respiratory system of the neonates. In uh, her lecture, Linda is going to cover the uh, pathophysiology of the lung injury of various diseases and then after the break i'm going to take you through some of the basics of the mechanical ventilation i will try to keep it as basic as possible and uh, for um, the objectives for today's webinar is to clarify some of the um, challenges associated with the mechanical ventilation so I hope um, you enjoyed the webinar today. And before we proceed with the presentation, I would like to ask you to use a raise your hand button to show me that you can see me and you can hear my voice. Let me just double check. Perfect. I'm seeing quite a bit of hands, so that's excellent. Um, so, without further ado, we are going to pass on the word to Linda, who is going to start with a recap of the previous modules and also share her knowledge and her experience when it comes to the um, neonatal lung injuries and lung diseases. So, welcome to everybody. Um, just to show you where you have been watching from, and um, thank you to everybody who has contacted and let us know and given us feedback. It's been phenomenal. Please do not forget that if you have missed the previous recordings, they are on YouTube. If you just put into YouTube search Dragon Neonatal, generally they will come up as first, second, and the um, lecture prior to this lecture was loaded last week. So they're all there for you, should you want to watch them. Um, and let's start. So we're just going to go over what we discussed last week. Uh, our last time, it is all regarding gaseous exchange. Um, and it's very important that we understand these concepts. So this is an alveoli. This is the capillary bed. As you can see, these blue little cells are the deoxygenated blood and as they go along they get red because they're being oxygenated and it's basically a principle of diffusion so oxygen gets breathed in and these two membranes meet up and the carbon dioxide comes this way and the oxygen goes into the capillary bed and when we're talking about ventilation this is something that you must keep in mind because if something goes wrong here, you will have problems ventilating. So the next that we're going to look at is the various traumas that we covered last time. So if we speak about volume trauma, volume trauma has to do with air entering here and the stretching of the alveoli and literally the tearing that occurs whereby barrow trauma has to do with being up against here and causing damage there 
atelectal trauma has to do with very low or no PEEP. And um, you can see that because we have a sick patient, we are going to have reactions. So you can clearly see here that you've got cytokine production and that in long term with interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 are going to start developing problems and we will get biotrauma. Biotrauma has to do with everything going on here as well as the kidney and the gut. And this is very, very important that we remember these. Also, remembering that when we're looking at something like ARDS in adults, we are dealing very often, ARDS, if they don't have COVID, will develop due to an excessive fluid recess, often a, a crystalloid recess. So it's very, very important that we always keep in, in, in when we're resuscitating that it's not only about the pressure that we use to so-called bag the lung, but also that we're ensuring that there is adequate blood pressure, as well as that we're not giving excessive fluid, or that there's exudate sitting along here with something like a pneumonia, which is all going to make it very difficult to ventilate. So it's very, very important that we um, keep con that we keep watching what's going on there. And um, I have given, um, yeah. Okay, so the other um, problem or the other comment that we got was about ventilatory perfusion mismatch. So let's talk about what is perfusion match. So the V, well, we refer to it as VQ match or mismatch. So V stands for the volume of oxygen that is breathed in and moved into the alveoli to allow gaseous exchange. So if you've got a problem with the airway or perhaps the concentration of oxygen is low, it's going to affect the V part of the um, VQ match. Q re represents perfusion or blood flow. And this is very, very important because if this blood pressure is too high and it's pushing back against the alveoli, we will get poor gaseous exchange. If the blood pressure is too low and the alveoli, despite giving extra PEEP, cannot meet up with the capillary bed, we won't have gaseous exchange. So this is a dynamic balance. It's an interplay between breathing and cardiac output, allowing for gaseous exchange. And this is a very, very important concept. Next, we would say so that if there is a VQ mismatch, this happens if either the oxygen flow or the blood flow is affected. What can affect the oxygen flow? So an obstruction in the airway could do it. Um, and we will go through the physiology just now, but if we look at what the mechanical causes are, an increase of too much pressure. So if you've got far too much pressure, as you see here in dead space ventilation, it will push down on this capillary bed and we won't get decent gaseous exchange. So the two mechanical causes are the use of too high pressure or volume and the increased dead space. If you have too high pressure or volume, and you go to suction the patient and you disconnect the patient, what you very often will see is that the, the saturation will start raise, rising. And when this happens, then you sort of have an idea that you might have a VQ mismatch on the pressure or the volume side. When we look at physiological causes to ventilatory perfusion mismatch, it's all the pathologies we see. So pneumonia, um, which would give us exudate around in this alveolar. BPD or bronchopulmonary display, which will give us tears and thickening all around here, as well as sometimes in the capillary bed. Bronchitis, which is um, inflammation and exudates in the bronchi. Pulmonary edema. So if you've had quite a vicious recess and you've had volume trauma, you very often see pulmonary edema or barrow trauma. They often have these pink secretions, so that will tell you there's a VQ mismatch. 
a pulmonary embolus. So that would be a blockage somewhere along in the capillaries, which is preventing decent gaseous exchange, or as I said, an airway obstruction. So if there is an adequate ventilation and or gaseous exchange, we get a hypopoxic vasoconstriction happening. And this just spirals out of control if we're not careful. So we've always got to make sure that we are doing the correct ventilation, trying to keep this lung perfusing at its optimum. If we have had a, vas a hypoxic vasoconstriction, then we will see that there's shunting of blood which occurs to the perfusing part of the lung. So the blood that cannot be oxygenated will shunt to the perfusing part of the lung. However, please remember, the HB component which carries oxygen cannot be stimulated in any way to carry more oxygen than it is determined to carry. If every little red blood cell has to carry six atoms of oxygen, you cannot force it to carry eight. <coughs> Sorry. And it will then lead to a lower PO2 reading on your blood gas. So just remember that. So now we can, now that we've done the recap, we can now move into um, some of the diseases that we see in the newborn. In the previous lecture, we covered the respiratory distressed patient and tach transient tachypnea of the newborn, or TTN, transient tachypnea newborn, is a common cause of a respiratory distressed infant. So what does transient tachypnea of the newborn mean? During um, pregnancy and, um, yeah, during pregnancy, the lungs are fluid log filled. They have got fluid in it. If a baby moves through the birth canal, past reason for moving through the birth canal is this pressure that happens on the chest wall. And in that, the fluid gets shifted from the lung into the lymphatics and out. Now, if a baby, a baby is born via cesarean section, very often these babies bubble. That's what we say because of retained lung fluid. And what you will see is that when you go near them, there's lots of little bubbles coming out of their nose and mouth. And this is what we term transient tachypnea of the newborn. You can see in the x-ray that it has this almost ground glass appearance, almost like HMD or respiratory distress of the newborn, but not as bad. And what are the risk factors? Maternal diabetes, because these babies generally are big, so macrosomia. A cesarean section mostly gives you TTN. A male baby is often worse. Maternal asthma can do it. And a delivery at a lower weight will do it. So what happens with these babies is they present with tachypnea, they need some oxygen. Their blood, go, um, their, um, blood gas shows that there's no raised um, PCO2. The baby will get tired if it's not helped um, or, or carefully monitored. Male, there's an increase in male infants and it generally resolves itself. It usually takes between 12 and 24 hours for a TTN to actually um, resolve and disappear. The baby will grunt and bubble from its nose and mouth. And that grunting is like, uh, uh, uh. The baby often works quite hard, and this could be distressing to the parent. They very often need high flow oxygen or nasal CPAP. And it's important that you consider putting this baby prone. And the reason for that, we covered in the previous module where we spoke to you about when the baby is prone, we get better expansion of all the lobes of the lung. We will wean the oxygen fairly rapidly. The rule of anything above 94 still applies. We may need to give the baby IV therapy. It's important to start colostrum feeding. And if the baby's just on nasal cannula or CPAP and we are able to give 
you give a baby to mom, then we should be doing skin to skin. And this is very important to explain to the mom. It's just a transient um, uh, situation and it will go away. The next one that we will often look at and see, especially in developing countries, is we do see quite a bit of meconium aspiration syndrome. And the reason for this is, is that very often we do not have the support that is needed. So babies, mothers in labor are left in labor for a long period of time. The baby becomes distressed. The baby passes meconium in utero, and this is often inhaled during the birthing process, especially if the baby's already in the birth canal and it, it, there is some meconium that has landed in the canal during the breaking of water, of the waters, or because the baby passed it um, as it went into the birth canal and now it's lining in there. It usually um, happens during the asphyxiated phase of delivery. As the asphyxiated phase of delivery is when the baby becomes so acidotic that it is going to take a breath in that birth canal, and that often is when the meconium enters the airway. Meconium can block airways, leading to atelectasis and give us a VQ mismatch because meconium is very viscous and it actually sticks very easily to the airways. The problem here is that before we used to try and suction it out. And in actual fact, the research now shows that we should not be um, suctioning the meconium. If you can wipe it away, you can, but don't go hunting for meconium to suction out of the airway. It can lead to atelectasis. Atelectasis is when we have collapse of various alveoli. And very often this atelectasis will occur in these upper airways here because the babies aren't breathing exceptionally well. It also gives you these hyperinflated look to the chest x-ray. Air is always black and you can clearly see how high up there's these hyperinflated areas. And you can develop a pneumonitis. Now, a pneumonitis will automatically, if I go back here, will automatically set off the cytokine response here. Because somewhere along here, we've now had meconium stick and it's become. Um, it, it, it's, it irritates the, the, the alveoli space and you, you start seeing the cytokine storm developing with interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and you start seeing this movement happen. That's what happens during a pneumonitis. And so it's very important that when we are dealing with these children that we very carefully look at how we ventilate, which is something that... Um, will happen quite easily. So what happens, as you can see here on the diaphragm, here we have the bronchiole, here we have the little sacs or the alveoli sacs sitting there and the meconia moves in. Now it can cause a blockage like it is done here. So ventilating this is going to become a massive problem. And it can also cause a pneumonitis along here. And you can see how you get this atelectasis developing. So what you get is you get a chemical inflammation and there's no surfactant that has been activated. So you get atelectasis or collapsing of the alveoli. You get intrapulmonary shunting. Remember what we said, that these aren't actually able to perfuse and that gaseous exchange can't happen. So the blood will shunt to one that it can happen to. There's uneven ventilation. There are air leaks. There's hypoxemia and acidosis. You could get, and very often, we don't see it as often as we used to, but we often did see this so-called pulmonary hypertension that occurs or persistent fetal circulation due to meconium aspiration. That has 
um, over time improved and thank goodness for that because those babies are severely ill. But we do still see it, especially in large babies. You also get air trapping and mechanical obstruction due to air trapping with this uneven ventilation. So you have interpleural shunting together with uneven ventilation. And this gives you this hypoxemia acidosis. So what you will see is that you've got a lowered O2 and you've got a CO2 that is stacking. You can have air leaks as well. So what is the management? You may need to suction what you can just out of the upper airways, but please do not try to do the deep suction. The baby will require ventilatory support. The baby can need surfactant because remember what we saw here, surfactant inactivation. So sometimes in, in the units and the countries where surfactant is more affordable, the babies will be given the, the um, chance of getting surfactant. Antibiotics will be given to prevent the pneumonitis. We may cool the baby due to the asphyxia that is present and the doctors could elect to give steroids. Congenital pneumonias. This it is far more common than we actually think. And we do see this fairly often in a so-called, it should have been an uneventful delivery. Very often um, babies born at about 38, 39 weeks um, and suddenly start presenting with respiratory distress. Here you can see the pneumonia very typically in the upper right hand of the lung. Now, um, this can happen quite often, and it also happens in, in during the first day um, post-delivery. Um, and if we look at this x-ray, you can just see, look how flattened um, the diaphragm is. This baby is really battling to breathe. And um, if you look at this ET tube, the endotracheal tube, it looks like it's slightly too high. It's also, this baby's also got a very big nasogastric tube in. So it is important that you orientate yourself. Um, also, you will notice that the arms here are raised above the head. Um, but you can clearly see this pneumonia sitting in this upper right lobe. And that is a common area for seeing it. It may be bacterial, viral, or fungal, and that's problematic. Bacterial, we can treat with um, antibiotics. Viral, we can treat with antivirals. Fungal, very often, is very, very hard to treat, and these children are quite sick. There will be respiratory distress with grunting. They often have secretions. Often, the secretions will only occur as the... Um, baby improves and the exudate loosens up and actually exits through this ET tube. The baby will be hemodynamically unstable, especially the temperature and is likely to be apneic. And the temperature here, this baby will battle to maintain its temperature. It's very, very, very rare that you will see a baby with pyrexia with a congenital pneumonia. I've, I've only ever seen it once. And the baby may be hypo or hyperglycemic. Um, um, one of the big issues here would be suctioning this baby to get that exudate out. How is it diagnosed? It's diagnosed by a chest X-ray with bloods. It's also diagnosed clinically and also via a blood gas. What is the treatment? Supportive oxygenation, nasal CPAP and ventilation if required. Um, the baby will need IV therapy for antibiotics, antifungals or um, uh, antivirals um, if necessary. Positioning would be very important. Very, very often you would have to place these babies um, lying down on the on that lung lobe to expand it or use the prone position. 
you would give nasogastric feeds to reduce the work of um, the load of working. You can start TPN and you may start vitamin D fairly early, especially in the COVID patient if you are seeing them. Next, um, we are going to look at bronchopulmonary dysplasia or BPD. This is one of the five diseases or disease patterns that are looked at via the VON system, the Vermont um, Oxford system that many people across the world um, feed data into. So there are um, five disease pro, um, processes we look at. It is BPD, it is NEC, it is ROP, um, IVH, and I think developmental problems. And this bronchopulmonary dysplasia is a disease which we used to see um, very, very frequently. Now we see it far less. However, these sort of x-rays in the babies, especially the male infants that we will see, do look like this. And what this is, is due to barrow trauma, volume trauma, and atelectal trauma, these babies have scarring in their lungs. Um, very many of the older nurses always refer to it as baby COPD or congestive cardiac... Oh, I'll think of it now. Pulmonary disease, obstructive, chronic obstructive airway disease or um, COPD. These babies are still oxygen dependent after 28 days post delivery. The most common babies to develop BPD are our extreme micropremies. However, we are starting to improve the situation. And you can see in this X-ray how severe the interstitial changes are and the scarring that has occurred. And so gaseous exchange becomes quite difficult. These children live on nasal um, cannulas. They can go home on nasal cannula if there's a support system to do that. And they will slowly wean off their oxygen as their lung improves. Um, you can clearly see that this x-ray here, baby's not very straight. We have to say that. This that you see here is a suction, um, inline suction. What you see here is the ET tube, which is very, very high. Notice the bronchi and the aerograms that are occurring as well. This baby's not very straight, and it also looks like it's swallowed quite a bit of air. So bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or BPD, is a form of chronic lung disease that develops in preterm infants, which have been treated with oxygen and with um, positive pressure ventilation. They can even develop it having just had the LISA method done and being put onto CPAP. Um, we see less of it, but we do see it. So if you look at these little x-rays here, they're talking about the alveoli here. There's easy delivery of oxygen and gaseous exchange, where with BPD, these are very stiff alveoli due to the scarring that has occurred. And it will take this baby up to about two years before those lungs have coped or, or, or sort of improved to deal with it. So they, these babies very often present with a wheeze post um, discharge. The pathophysiology is complex and poorly understood as it's multifactorial and affects gaseous exchange, as I said, because these lungs are stiff, they are not easily going to meet up with the, um, with, uh, the capillary bed for gaseous exchange. Very often, a vigorous recess has shown to contribute with barrow and volume trauma. The, the biggest reason for these babies to have it is for them to have had a vigorous recess and a longish period prior to the administration of surfactant. And if I say longish period, then it usually is um, about generally two hours um, 
before they receive um, surfactant. And in that time, a lot of damage is done. In these children, the growth parameters are very important. They need weekly weights, weekly lengths done, weekly circumference of heads done, because these children have an incredible use of energy. We very often have to supplement the breast milk or even the formula. So the significant risk factors here will be prolonged ventilation. So being on a ventilator for a few weeks. And this is where as nurses, we play a very important role. Not only is it about reducing that oxygen level as quickly as we can, but it is ensuring that we keep these babies calm and fairly relaxed so that they, they utilize the third sense in their head. Remember that we've spoken about this before. You have five outer senses, and then you have three senses in your head, vestibular, proprioception, and something called interoception. The calmer you can keep these babies in the beginning, the better chance you have of getting them off the ventilator. So positioning, and we will see this towards the end of the lecture, becomes very, very important, as well as ensuring that you do all your nursing skills. So reducing high levels of oxygen, preventing infections, and one of the biggest ways of preventing infection is allowing skin to skin or kangaroo care. So the baby colonizes with the healthy buds from the parent and the baby isn't colonizing with your hospital acquired bud. Prematurity is very important. That part, it, 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 the more prem the baby is, the higher chance of bronco or BPD. Low maternal levels of vitamin D have been shown to be a very big contributing factor to, to the development of BPD. However, adding vitamin D early on does not improve the outcome of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So the research is showing that vitamin D in pregnancy is probably far more beneficial than trying to solve it later on. An untreated PDA would be problematic as well. So that would flood the lungs, that would increase the need for oxygen, and so, and this often happens in prematurity, and that will all add to prolonged ventilation or being on, on, on some form of ventilation. Additional um, risk factors, pulmonary emphysema. Also, babies that have developed pulmonary edema, which we now know arises from your barrow and your volutrauma. High peak inspiratory pressures and what will happen here is that um, I'm sure that um, Margarita will cover that. But just to say, remember that your mean airway pressure is quite important. By not taking up your peak pressure, but taking up your peep pressure, very often you will see that your mean airway pressure or your MAP will do the same thing. It is those high peak pressures that pul cause pulmonary um, the, uh, BPD because of overexpansion. You're not going to get, if you've got a baby that's O2 is, is, is lingering and you're not getting it up on the blood gas and the HB is say nine grams per liter, and now we don't give the blood transfusion, it doesn't help to put increased PEEP Peak, peak pressure on the ventilator in the hope that you are going to improve ventilation. No, because you're just going to over distend the alveoli. You have to treat the other symptoms. The other symptoms being is the baby may be anemic, is there maybe an untreated vitamin, uh, untreated PDA, is there perhaps infection? Those things need to be treated to prevent these risk factors. Long end tidal volumes, Increased pulmonary artery pressure, which could be an undiagnosed cardiac lesion, especially in preemies, male babies, and maternal smoking. Maternal smoking actually causes BPD more often than we think, especially when the babies 
have to go home and they go home into that smoky environment and they get worse. The premature lung is vulnerable to inflammatory changes, which in turn cause less alveoli to form, and it allows the interstitium to thicken and vascularization to develop abnormally. Please remember that the lung is only properly formed after 34 weeks. And so if this baby is very prim, you're going to see less alveoli forming, because you've got this thickening that has occurred, and I'm going to take you back to that very terrible x-ray. You can see the thickening here. Because of all of that, we are now um, having problems. You will have problems with gaseous exchange as well. This increases the resistance, which then leads to pulmonary hypertension. Many of these babies go on to Viagra as part of their treatment to reduce the pulmonary hypertension. The diagnosis is done via chest x-ray and it's also done clinically and very often we will do a cardiac sonar to pick up this pulmonary hypertension. Oxygen of more than 21% for more than 21, 28 days or still needing oxygen at 36 weeks is the criteria for giving the diagnosis of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So even if this baby was born at 35 weeks and now on day 21, they are still on oxygen, we would consider them to have BPD. So maybe something went wrong in the resuscitation or they had a severe pneumonia, we would not know. Right, so what does the chest X-ray look like? It has this hazy appearance. There may often be cysts or bullae that occur. And this has a poor prognosis when we start seeing cysts or bullae, which are literally pockets of exudate that can become infected. They're scarring and they present with this emphysemic picture. So just like um, a person who has smoked all their life, you will hear that wheeze and that cough come out. You can clearly see here, again, we're seeing aerobronchograms. This baby's very sick and he is still intubated. And look at the diaphragm, also a little bit um, flattened. What is the prognosis? They have a high incidence of death rate in the first year especially if they go untreated. There's very, very most often growth failure that occurs. They have very um, big neurodevelopmental problems. I don't understand this. Let me just sort this out. They have very definite neurodevelopmental problems that occur. Um, and very often... Um, there are other problems as well. So they will be slow. They um, won't easily um, pick up where they are. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to sort out my power source. Um, they have developmental problems. They can develop asthma. They do develop asthma. They have reoccurring bronchial pneumonias and there's a respiratory compromise that occurs. These children from a developmental point of view are very difficult because um, a lot of the, the, the therapists do not understand that they require quite a bit of um, exercise and expansion to actually get these, these lungs to function properly. How do we treat them? Nutrition, 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 nutrition. Um, we lower their fluid intake to prevent the pressure in their lungs. We can give diuretics, as I have said before, they get um, the anti-pulmonary hypertension drugs, such as Viagra. We will supplement them with oxygen. We, they, we will immunize them against RSV at least three times in countries where it's affordable. They are given bronchodilators, and as I have said, these children do require exercise. One of the big things with these babies is tummy time, because that allows them to develop decent intercostal muscles. How do we present, prevent BPD? 
Antenatal cortis corticosteroids are very important. So those two doses before anything happens, um, that becomes quite important. Um, surfactant administration as quickly as possible within first 20 minutes would be optimal. Early continuous um, positive pressure ventilation, not letting them work hard. So yes, you earn your ventilator, but you mustn't overwork it. Early caffeine, which has been shown. There are a few controversial articles that have now come out that says they're not too sure about the 24-hour administration of court, um, caffeine, but they're talking about 72-hour administration of um, caffeine because of its chance of causing NEC. Permissive hypercapnia, in other words, we allow the PCO2 to raise if it doesn't affect the, the um, pH on the blood gas. Vitamin A has been shown to help, and we avoid large volumes of fluid. This, this becomes a vicious circle because very often initially they need a lot of nutrition and the, the way they take in nutrition is by fluid. So very often we have to supplement their milk quite quickly so that they don't take too big a volume of milk but have they feel satisfied. And remember, because of them breathing hard, and being stressed, they will push up their basal metabolic rate. So it's almost like you're chasing your tail. Next diagnosis, which we're going to look at, is the hypoplastic lung. Now, these days, we are not seeing as many hypoplastic lung undiagnosed. We are seeing them but we're not seeing the undiagnosed one because the fetal scans are picking them up earlier and we are able to prepare the parents for this or if it is an exceptionally big hyperplastic lung, um, there might be the option to terminate. It is a rare congenital abnormality with um, characterized by in, incomplete lung development. It impairs the gaseous exchange and because of this, there is respiratory insufficiency because there's a reduced amount of alveoli or even um, part of the um, lung lobes may be and also be um, involved here. It's most often caused due to a diaphragmatic hernia on the left side causing the herniation of the abdominal content. So how this works is that in about week 12, the diaphragm between actually week 9 and, and, and 15, the diaphragm grows from the back, from the spine forward. And it will then, it grows from both sides, from the spine, it grows outward and forward. And um, in these children, usually the diaphragm on the left side has failed to develop. If the baby um, presents with a right-sided um, hypoplastic um, lung with a diaphragmatic hernia, these children are much sicker and their chance on survival is actually quite low. Depending on the severity, the baby may survive if there's sufficient tissue that has developed and we can give gentle ventilatory support. Okay, so they have what we call a scaphoid abdomen, flattened abdomen. They have a flattened chest wall on chest x-ray and I'll show you now what it looks like. They, they initially do fairly okay within the first sort of 10 minutes of delivery because they've still got a ductus and they're in that transition period, which we've discussed before. So how do we treat these babies? They're very often oscillated or high frequency is used because it's gentler. We give support therapy, we counsel parents and they have surgery possibly within 24 hours to 48 hours of being delivered. There would be two or three problems that we would have to deal with. Um, where's the picture? That we would have to deal with. 
the one would be that we would have um, the, uh, the diaphragm that isn't present. So that's going to have to take that they would have to put in something called a vortex patch um, to allow that diaphragm now to, to start working. They would have to remove the intestines and bring them downwards. And sometimes there's a problem there because you'll have taunt abdominal muscles because the the intestines haven't been in the abdomen on top of which they would also still be difficult to ventilate because you may not have any of the lobes or a lobe missing generally on the left side of 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 the chest so let's look at the role of vitamin d Vitamin D is not actually a vitamin, but it's a pre-hormone that doesn't only work with bone min miner mineralization, but it, it also plays a very big role in immunity and preventing type 1 diabetes in infants and children. So it also deals a lot with the endocrine system of the body. And as we have learned during COVID, vitamin D has become quite essential. Studies done by Bos Kabadi, I hope I've said that correctly, from Iran, has shown that lower vitamin D levels in the mother and the preterm infant leads to worsening respiratory distress syndrome. And this affects their length of stay in the hospital, as well as their chances of developing lung complications. And that link there is the link to the article. The European guidelines now suggest that in the very low birth weight baby, they should be receiving between 800 and 1,000 international daily units of vitamin D for at least two weeks. In South Africa, we are still giving 400 international units. However, I am starting to see that the doctors are taking it up to 800 units now. Vitamin D helps with calcium uptake and bone minera mineralization. Very difficult word for me to say. It is also involved in the immune system and early lung development. It has shown to prevent diabetes type 1 as well as asthma. And it also plays a very important role in many viral respiratory infections, even in the RSV um, infection that we see. And as I said, it plays a role in COVID. Now we are coming to a very important part of dealing with a child on the ventilator. And this is with regards to suctioning these babies. Suctioning these babies can be very stressful and studies have shown that it raises their cortisol levels. And as you know from previous lectures, cortisol is very, very dangerous in big doses because it changes the pathway in the brain and it also is actually the natural cortisone, so it will have all those problems. So I prefer that the staff use a four-handed method to reduce the stress. And what this means is that we cup the baby and fold the baby and suction the baby then. Suctioning has shown in this article um, from neonatal nursing to drop saturations, increase heart rates and respiratory rates. So one has to be very careful doing suctioning. The goal of suctioning is to remove as much secretions as possible to allow for good gaseous exchange because secretions in, in a small airway will reduce um, the flow of air into the lung. Such suctioning causes stress, inflammation and pain in the upper airways of this baby. And it has shown that there is no optimal number or time to suction. Babies should be suctioned when they need it and not just suctioned because we think that they should be suctioned. Now, before I go any further, I do need to talk to you around a few things. Before you suction a baby, please make sure that your strapping here is A, 
correct, be adequate and not what we call riding. If this tube can go in and out, you are far better off strapping the baby and then, re and then suctioning the baby because you have got a very good chance of losing your airway if this tube is rising. The other thing to remember is that you have to suction the airways as well. You cannot think that you are just going to, I just want to see where my cursor is, suction the ET tube and not the airways around it. And now I hope I don't make you all a bit confused. But I just want to go back into an x-ray here. Here you can clearly see the ET tube. Now one of the things to remember is that babies A don't have sinuses and B they have secretions and if they've got sticky lung secretions they are more than likely to have other sticky secretions. What very often happens is if you do not clear the airway all the way up, so suction the, the nose, the na nasal passage, as well as the back of the throat, what you do get is very often you get, um, I don't know, secretions that become sticky and tacky. We've got a word for it in South Africa, but I best not use it because quite revolting um, and this secretion comes down secretions will follow the path of least resistance it's not going to go up and be coughed out that ain't going to happen what will happen is it will slide along this ET tube and very often the baby gives a breath and that secretion that clump of mucus is actually breathed in into the ET tube and now causes an obstruction. And everybody goes, oh, this child, this child's got plug formation, plug formation. Very often it is not plug formation that is occurring. It's actually due to secretions in this nose at the back of the throat that has gone down the nasal, the, the, the ET tube and now being breathed in. And that causes a problem in 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 this way so when you suction you do have to ensure that you clear the nasal passages and what's sitting at the back of the throat because these babies don't suck and swallow they will collect um, mucus at the back of their throat remember that they swallow a huge amount of mu mucus every day the goal of suctioning is, is to remove as much as you can, and we only suction when necessary. Long-term suction will lead to speech delay and feeding difficulty. And this is where the problem arises. We do get colleagues, and we may be that colleague that thinks that we should suction this child all the time. If you can wipe it away, wipe it away. Initially, a baby sucks on reflex, but premies and sick term infants are known to volume limit and refuse solid later on because of over suctioning in the neonatal unit. And this becomes a huge problem developmentally when we see these children post discharge. They also develop an oral aversion and this is part of their sensory overload. A baby has a suck reflex. In neonatal intensive care, it will suck. But when it goes home and the reflexes disappear, they stop sucking because they've developed an oral aversion. So how do we suction? Suctioning is a clean surgical procedure requiring planning and a social hand wash before. As I have said, we use the forehand method which is cupping this baby. So you and your colleague do it together. One person cups and folds. If you don't have inline suction, then the, that person will disconnect and allow you to suction and reconnect. And please watch the monitor. You have to have a dressing pack, gauze and saline, if you are allowed to use saline. In many units, saline is not used every day. 
ensure the baby is supine and that the baby is able to be suctioned. And when I mean supine, I mean not just flat on its back, but that you can cup it. Saline suctioning tends to increase the heart rate and decrease saturation. However, if it is necessary, we do need to do it. The catheter is twirled out while activating the suction. Do not suction on your way in. Ensure you clean the nasal passages around the ET tube and the nasogastric tube, else that's where your plugging is probably originating from. Then we have to talk about family-centered care. It is important to involve the parent all the way. If they do not want to be present for suctioning, that is fine, but please do not have a conversation if mum is present because babies pick up on voices. And so very often they will know that the, that the parents are there. Touch and holding the baby during suctioning definitely reduces stress. Involve the parents in all the care and listen to the parent. Many units ask parents to leave during suctioning. It is not a bad thing, but listen to the parent. If the mother says to you, I can hear secretions, I can feel secretions, please don't fob her off. Please make sure you check with her. When we look at positioning, this is a nursing responsibility and it's very important and it will dramatically improve your outcome. So temperature control in the prone position allows for a much better neutral thermal environment. If you want this poster, please contact either Katya or uh, Margarita, or if you have my email, you're welcome to contact me and I will give you a copy of this poster. It is my own poster. Skin to skin allows for good, best control, positioning wise and breathing wise. So putting that baby to the mother's chest may actually improve the breathing. Comfort flexion helps with self-soothing and muscle control. So putting that baby down flexed so that it's comfortable. Supine sleeping promotes apnea and hypoxic episodes in premature infants. Nutrition, preemies and sick babies absorb better prone. If you have a larger aspirate when you're feeding these babies who are working, obviously through a nasogastric tube, consider placing the baby prone. It will absorb its feed better. A flexed position promotes joint alignment and symmetry. And being flexed, placed prone will allow for stretching of the shoulder and the hip girdle. Your shoulder girdle. Your writing depends on your shoulder girdle development. If you can't write properly, it's from your shoulder where the problem originates, not your pincer grip. Gaseous exchange is much better and much higher when placed prone, allows for better um, positioning and prone positioning allows for better cerebral perfusion after 72 hours. Prior to 72 hours, we ask that you nurse the baby side to side. And in premies under um, 28 weeks for the first 72 hours, we want to reduce the raised intracranial pressure. So we will nurse them from side to side. Um, here are the apps that we suggest that perhaps you look at. This app here is a Resus app. It's um, you, you can download it for free. It's from the American Association of Pediatrics. This here is the Growth app, which has premature growth, um, growth, well, we call them road to health growth charts, which are male and female orientated. It also gives you um, growth charts with regards to syndromic babies. This here is your decibel meter. Guys, if I had my way, every unit would have a Draeger ear in it. However, if you're not able to do that, you can download this and you can literally open this app 
put your cell phone down and measure the decibel at this bell unit in your unit. They should not be about 65. You'll be amazed what you see with this. And it's an easy way to create awareness amongst staff. This is a light meter, and this also helps. Now, why have we put these apps on here for respiratory? Light and noise will prevent a baby from calming down. And for those reasons, we've put them there. Growth is often problematic in babies with respiratory problems and vigorous recessing we have shown can cause big lung problems. They are where they are and um, where you can find them in Apple Store or in Play Store. There is the suggested reading. Some of these articles, this, some of these articles are very important. And one of them, the one that's just highlighting at the moment, talks about bedesonide, or in South Africa, the brand name for the drug is Palmicort, nebulization of premature infants. Um, nebulization with bedesonide, which is a corticosteroid, has been shown to reduce um, BPD. Um, if it is done correctly, and that can be considered. So I have left that article there for you. And then on, if you are on Twitter, here are some articles for you to follow. This is the Journal of Neonatology. Vigon often have um, a lot for you to see. This is the Cochrane Review System, the neonatal one. Um, so these are the people that you can follow on Twitter. And then we will now have a short break so that Margarita can contact. So welcome back everyone. And uh, we are now starting with the second part of our webinar. And today I'm gonna to be doing a hands-on demonstration on the neonatal ventilation with the Drager Ventilator Baby Lothian 800. Some of you might have had experience with our older models, Baby Lothian 8000 plus, Baby Lock the N500, and this is our newest addition to the portfolio that we launched early last year. So, um, and today I'm going to focus mostly on the uh, mechanical ventilation and on the neonatal mechanical ventilation. So, I'm going to put you in a, a closer look. And I think before we start with the mechanical ventilation, we should remember or we should revise what is the traditional concept of mechanical ventilation. I think starting from 1952, when the, when the babies start to be ventilated, traditionally uh, the babies of oh, the neonatal patient are being ventilated in pressure controlled mode. Pressure limited time cycled ventilation. So, and probably the most no, not at the moment, but back in the days, most common ventilation mode that was available at that time was uh, the um, pressure controlled ventilation, which had a name um, IPPV, CMV. So basically we have pressure controlled CMV. We have major setting parameters, which is we have the inspiratory pressure, we have the respiratory rate, we have the setting for the positive and the expiratory pressure, and we have the inspiratory time. Obviously, in the newer models of the ventilators, we had we have the setting which is called slow, but for the time being, I'm going to change this to the uh, general to the more common um, ventilation, which is called the um, inspiratory flow. So all of us, I think, are more familiar with the concept of using the flow. So, and um, usually, depending on the patient size, we will have that we have a new patient, and depending on the patient size, we can uh, select the patient weight. So we can select the patient weight, and we, let's assume that we have a patient of about 1,000 kilograms, so it's a preterm infant, 
and you see that the ventilator automatically adjusts the uh, ventilation settings based on the patient category that we select. So I'm going to reduce the respiratory rate a little just for the ease of demonstration and I'm going to start with roughly 60 breaths per minute so that one breath cycle equals to one second and I think we are good to go. So I'm going to start the ventilation and what we will see on the display, we are in the pressure controlled ventilation. We have the pressure curve, we have the flow curve and we have the volume curve. I think before we start, uh, before we start with discussing the ventilation modes, we need to have a look at what what, what, what of this each individual curves represents. So the pressure curve is a curve that represents the uh, functionality of the device. It doesn't necessarily have any uh, patient related information because we have a um, microprocessor controlled ventilator and the pressure is being delivered using a high precision pressure valve by the machine. So the only, re the only time when our pressure curve will not be there is when we have a mechanical issue with the ventilator. So only in case if the ventilator is not functioning properly, you will have certain, uh, uh, like certain um, changes in the pressure curve. So I'm going to demonstrate that to you. And please pay attention to the flow curve and to the volume curve. I'm going now to uh, uh, reduce the compliance of the lung. So basically, I have a smart test lung, and you see that our volume curve flattens our time volume. I'm just going to check this. Our time volume went down, but our pressure curve remained the same. So that means that we don't really have the information that patients related. So I'm just going to reduce the alarms. I'm going to reduce the alarms. So uh, the flow curve is the patient related information and the volume curve is the information about the breath by breath um, time volume that is being delivered to our patients. So, and we are now in the pressure, we should be in the pressure controlled CMV. So we are now in pressure control, continuous mandatory ventilation mode. So it's a completely mandatory ventilation mode where we have uh, 60 breaths per minute delivered with the inspiratory pressure of 50 and with a peak of five. So basically the ventilator delivers this breath per breath uh, regardless of the patient breathing efforts. And this is how the mechanical ventilation for neonates have been uh, done in the past. So what are the challenges or what are the disadvantages of the uh, continuous mandatory ventilation? Let's Currently, our patient does not breathe spontaneously. So now, I will try to simulate when our patient starts to breathe spontaneously. And what we see on the display, that is a great example. So we have a patient who started the breath and the patient took the breath and started with the exhalation. So we can see the lower part here. We started with the exhalation and then the time came for the new breath to be delivered. You see what we can even see in the volume curve that the patient started to inhale and then we started to exhale. And then when there was a time for the new breath cycle, we have a mandatory breath. So continuous mandatory ventilation, the biggest disadvantage is that 
system through no synchronization with the patient breathing efforts. So in this particular case, we have breath stacking, which can lead to uh, increased intrinsic fib in the patient lung, and which can lead to potential over distension. And as a result, may cause a pneumothorax, a pneumothorax in the long term. Because the patient has not yet fully exhaled, so there is a certain amount of the volume remains in the lung, and the ventilator, because the time has come, delivered an additional mechanical breath. So there is more volume delivered to the patient lung. So, and that is exactly the challenge with the older way of ventilating our patients in continuous mandatory ventilation. So the clinicians in the 60s started to look at the ways on how you can optimize and how you can uh, improve the ventilation. And that's how we came to the concept of synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. So, and that is our so-called PCSIMV. So if we look at our ventilation mode, PCSIMV, we see that we have exactly the same parameters. So we have the inspiratory pressure, we have the respiratory rate, we have the inspiratory time and the PIP. So even now, if we now activate PCSIMV, we see there is no change in the curves. So curves look exactly the same as they looked before. But now the, the advantage of the PCSIMV, synchronized, intermittent mandatory ventilation that is in the synchronization. So we now have a trigger window uh, in which the patient can trigger a breath. So let's have a look. So we see that there are no more breath stacking. So what we can have a look here so you see the patient starts the inhalation. The moment we meet the trigger criteria, the ventilator adds, or the ventilator starts with the mechanical breath. And then on the next breath, we see again, the patient starts the inhalation. We meet the trigger criteria and how we know that the patient triggered the breath, we see the little lung function, the lung single. So we see that the patient triggered the breath and the ventilator delivered the mechanical breath. So now we no longer have the challenges of uh, asynchrony. So there is no longer any fighting between the patient and the ventilator. The ventilator follows the lead of the patient. So the patient decides when this mechanical breath is being delivered to him. So he starts the inhalation and we see that the, then the machine would deliver a mechanical breath. So that is, of course, a great advantage. And I think our usual settings of the flow of six to eight liters per minute that allows us to compensate or to, to support this spontaneous breathing of the patient, right? So, um, and the nature, or if we look at the ventilation mode, SIMV, we have the inspiratory pressure, we have the PEEP, and we have the respiratory rate. And the time volume that we deliver to our patient is the result between the uh, inspiratory pressure and the PEEP. So in our case, we go between 5 millibar to 15 millibar with a driving pressure of 10, which results in approximately 4 milliliters of tidal volume in this patient. So, and let's assume that uh, uh, 4 milliliters for a 1 kilogram baby is not sufficient if we target 4 to 6 liters per minute. 
Um, however, we, we feel that we can actually improve the ventilation uh, and we decide to perform a refractant uh, treatment. So I now change the compliance on my lung and please pay attention to the inspiratory pressure and to the tidal volume. So the inspiratory pressure, uh, I, I deliver the surfactant and what happens to the tidal volume? We went from four milliliters of the tidal volume to six milliliters of the tidal volume with, without any sort of changes to the inspiratory pressure. And that is a normal reaction we have because we have a pressure controlled ventilation in which the tidal volume is the result of the lung condition of the baby and the inspiratory pressure. And of course, we want to ensure that we are not delivering any excessive inspiratory pressure to our patients because we know that um, the lung injury, or at least the, the research suggests, the lung injury is associated, or we need, is associated with the excessive uh, pressures. However, can we really deal with this fluctuation in the tidal volume? What, what is tidal volume? Of course, tidal volume contributes to the oxygenation. But in a longer term, what is lung, what, what is tidal volume contributing to? It, it contributes to the death exchange. So um, if we look at the uh, oxygenation, what are the parameters? And Linda has mentioned those parameters. What are the parameters that are responsible for the oxygenation? We have two main parameters. We have, of course, the FiO2, which we can easily change between 21% and 100. And I think we've addressed this already multiple times that we have to be extremely careful in uh, delivering high percentage oxygen due to, uh, or due to such conditions as uh, retinopathy of prematurity, which can be caused by high concentration oxygen. Therefore, we have an alternative parameter which we can optimize through mechanical ventilation, um, and Linda has already mentioned it, which is responsible for oxygenation. And this parameter is called mean airway pressure. So our mean airway pressure is the main indicator after the FIO2 on the oxygenation of our patients. And there are multiple ways on how we can influence the mean airway pressure. There are actually five ways how we can influence the mean airway pressure. Of course, the first and the easiest would be to increase the inspiratory pressure. So, for example, if we go to from 15 to 20, what happens? We see that our mean airway pressure in the long term will gradually increase. We were at about 6.7. So now we are slowly growing the mean airway pressure to the uh, to about seven millibar. Another way of how we can influence the mean airway pressure is by increasing the PIP. So the PIP is responsible for maintaining the positive and expiratory pressure in the lung, and we can increase the PIP. Let's say from five to in our case, we'll go to, for example, seven, and let's see how that will contribute to our mean airway pressure. Again, we see an increase in mean airway pressure. So we went from about seven millibar to about nine millibar. So we are already oxygenating our patients a little bit better. So what else can we do? We can, of course, extend the inspiratory time, meaning that we can increase the phase of the higher pressure. So if we increase the respiratory time, let's see, we increase the respiratory time and what happens to our mean airway pressure, it is again 
uh, it is again growing to about 10 millibar. So we are now um, ventilating our patient even more effectively. We are oxygenating our patient even more effectively. So what else we can do to uh, increase the mean airway pressure? We can reduce the expiratory time so that we reduce the time in which the uh, patient spends on the pit. However, we don't have a direct parameter on how we can reduce the expiratory time. So what we can do, we can actually increase our inspiratory rate, or respiratory rate, and you see how our expiratory time has increased, has reduced substantially. So we have this period of zero flow, and now we barely meet the zero flow, and you see what happened to the female airway. Again, it has increased. So we have increased the ERP mean airway, uh, and we already covered the four the four uh, four ways by increasing the inspiratory pressure, by increasing the PIP, by increasing the inspiratory time, or by increasing the respiratory rate, and as a result, reducing the expiratory time. And the fifth way of how we can also influence our P mean airway is by increasing the flow. So what does flow represent? Flow is the amount of air that is currently sent from the ventilator into the pressure, into the patient circuit and into the patient lung in order to increase the pressure from PIP to PIP. So if we now increase the flow to 10 liters per minute. Let's have a look. We have, with six liters per minute, we have a relatively uh, uh, flat increase of the pressure. With the 10 liters per minute, we have a relatively uh, or a steeper increase. If we now increase the flow even further, let's say to 20 liters per minute, we are actually, uh, we can potentially cause uh, the um, peak inspiratory pressure to go overboard. So um, if we now increase it even further, let's say to the maximum of 30 liters per minute, we are really ventilating our patients quite, um, with, with quite high flows in the system. So, um, is there an alternative to the um, to, to to working with flow? I think we conceptually are used to having the flow of about six to eight liters per minute. And in case if we have no leakages, six to eight liters per minute is usually a sufficient amount of flow in order to uh, pressurize the pressure patient circuits and to start to deliver the inspiratory pressure to the patient. However, let's imagine, and where I can demonstrate this, let's imagine, I will take this one for now, let's imagine that we start to have a leak because in neonatal patients, we usually have a lot of leakages. So, and I'm going to simulate now a relatively large leak. So we went from the leak of uh, 0% to the leak of almost 70 to 80%. So, and we are still 90%, okay. And we are still able to deliver the about 20 millibar even with this flow. So six liters per minute is still sufficient enough to compensate for the leakage flow and to increase, to build up the pressure in the system. So what if I now add this spontaneous breathing effort of the patient into this equation? So we have almost 90% leak, 
we need to build up the pressure from 7 to 20. And I now start to breathe spontaneously. And what do we see on our uh, pressure curve? We see extremely unstable pressure curve. And so, for example, here, although our peak setting is about seven, we see a D to six millibar. I know that it's hard to read, but so currently the pressure is measured to six millibar. So what does it mean? It means that there is not enough flow to maintain, and you see the patient starts to breathe extremely, extremely hard, and this flow is not enough to maintain this spontaneous patient breathing efforts to maintain the feet on the stable level and to compensate for leak. So in order to avoid this, we would probably need to increase the flow a little. And by increasing the flow, you see that I don't have this dip in the fresh curve. So my peak has become relatively stable. So you don't, you don't see any dips on the expiration. But I had to manually adjust the flow. And if now we have recognized that the leakage is too high and we decided to reposition the ET tube and we have also decided to, um, uh, to ensure that the leak has been removed and we are now back. We are now ventilating our patient with eight liters per minute, which potentially to some patients might be too much. It's too high flow. So therefore, we would need to manually go back to the six liters per minute. So there's a lot of manual work. And in the uh, newest ventilators, we have an alternative to the flow, and it is called a flow. I'm going to show it to you. So we go into the system setup in the ventilation, in the general setting. So I'm going to switch to the slope. And you see that we no longer have the flow, but we have the slope function. And the slope function is measured in seconds, and it represents the amount of time that is required to go from the PIP to PIP, so from the positive and expiratory pressure into the inspiratory pressure. And it is now up to the um, ventilator to adjust the flow that is required in order to ensure that we have this flow. So let's imagine, let's see how it, how slope works. So if we now increase the slope to, for example, 30 seconds, we cannot go higher because our inspiratory time is 30, uh, 0.3 seconds, sorry, 0.3 seconds. And we see that it, 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 it needs, we need the entire inspiratory cycle to go from PIP to the PIP. So they, it's a very flat curve. So we are not really offering optimal ventilation for this particular patient. So if we now reduce the slope to one third of the inspiratory time, then we have a more optimal right time and we obviously deliver more tidal volume. If I now reduce the slope to zero, or 0 0.01, we will see that we can compare that the right time of this pressure curve is much higher than the right time of this pressure curve. So flow represents the amount of time that is needed to build up the pressure from PIP to the PIP, and it is now up to the machine to, uh, to, to deliver the right amount of flow. So we no longer have to manually adjust the flow on the ventilator. We just need to set 
the appropriate slow setting, and the recommendation is to keep it one third of the inspiratory time. So if our inspiratory time is 0.3 seconds, then the slope in this case would be between 0.1 to 0.12 seconds. And that is the physiological uh, increase of the pressure in order to ventilate the patients. So, um, obviously, we have practiced a lot. And while we were practicing, our patients complied since we are uh, just uh, demonstrate something. I would like to show two parameters and I would like to have a VT and VT. So um, I would like to show you two parameters. So while we were having this conversation, we our patient compliance unfortunately reduced and uh, the patient condition changed and we only now delivering about six uh, six milliliters of the time volume. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to increase the patient weight for the ease of calculation. So, and what we realize, let's say we have a two kg baby, and what we realize that although we are we are delivering six milliliters, but if we look at the tidal volume per kilogram of body weight, we are only now delivering three milliliters per kilogram. And if we look at the recommendation for lung protective ventilation, our target should be somewhere between four to six milliliters. So this is not enough. And what in this case we can do, we could of course manually further increase the pressure by two millibar and see whether we can improve the ventilation. Yeah, it went up a little bit, but not too much. Let's see, we increase by another two millibar. We see that the time volume has increased, but still uh, not good enough, still not quite there. So we, we decided to increase to the 25 and that's it. We don't feel comfortable to go higher than 25 on this patient. And we are now thinking what else can be done on this patient. How else can we optimize ventilation for this patient? So we kept on the pressure curve and it seems to be all right. Pressure curve is working. So let's now look at the flow curve. And actually, when you work with the ventilator and when you work with the graphs, funny enough, all the answers can be found in the flow or the volume curve. So let's have a look at the flow curve. We have, I'm going to freeze the waveform and let's start from the inspiration. So we start on the inspiration, we start with a zero flow, we increase the flow to deliver the tidal volume. So we deliver the tidal volume. And what, what we realize that at the end of inspiration, I hope you can see it a little bit, at the end of inspiration, we still have a little bit of flow. So the patients have still not yet finished the inspiration when the time came for machine to exhale. So what can we do in this case? We can actually now increase our inspiratory time by a little bit and say, okay, we're still not yet quite there. Are we going back? And suddenly, when we increase the time a little bit, we are now going down to zero flow, and we were able to increase our tidal ventilation even further. So we are now at the lower edge of the lung protective ventilation of four millibars, and we have a nice looking volume of flow curve that goes down to zero. That at the end of expiration, at the end of inspiration, our flow is going down to zero. So we are now really optimi optimizing the ventilation settings for this particular patient. However, we still see that four milliliters is probably not good enough. 
So we have decided to do a surfactant treatment. So obviously, when we perform a sur surfactant treatment, we would see an immediate impact on the lung compliance. So what we would expect that the lung compliance of the patient will increase. And that is exactly the case. Oops, sorry. And that is exactly the case. So we have delivered the surfactant. Obviously, now we are delivering about 13.5 milliliters and about six milliliters. Um, um, about six milliliters are being delivered per kilogram of body weight. So we are even close to seven. So we are now on the higher end of the lung protective ventilation. And interesting enough, the ventilator is telling us something. So the ventilator was telling us that potentially there might be an air tablet. Why is that? Let's have a look. Pressure looks quite normal. Let's have a look at the flow curve. So again, let's see. We have the inspiration. We have the end of inspiration. Let's put a course off. And we have a flow of 1.1 liters. So the patient isn't even close enough to, um, to finish the inhalation. So what we could do, we can again, increase the inspiratory time. However, the ventilator says that the uh, IU ratio would be the inverse. So in this case, what do we need to do? First of all, we would need to probably reduce our inspiratory, uh, respiratory rate because our baby is 2 kg. We don't need 80 uh, breaths per minute. So we would probably opt for something like 55 breaths per minute. And we would now try to increase the inspiratory pressure a little to see if we are able to go down. We are still not able to go down. So now we are barely going to the zero flow. We should probably increase a little bit further. So now we see that we are going down and that we still after the surfactant treatment. And once we optimize our ventilation settings, we realize that we are actually overventilating our patients because lung protective ventilation suggests that we need to aim for four to six milliliters of kilogram of body weight. So what we now need to do, we need to now reduce the inspiratory pressure and see if we can reach this four to six milliliter per kilogram of body weight target. 6.2, I still feel that it's too high for my taste. So I'm gonna go down a little and we now finally optimize with a lot of interventions. The question is, do you have the time to spend, I think I was here for about 20 minutes doing this interventions while doing your rounds? Or do you have the time to check in every single patient whether this ventilation are optimal and whether we need to increase the ventilation? And there is an answer to this. There is actually a possibility to activate the volume targets in the pressure control ventilation. And we will get the advantages of the volume targeted ventilation, so stable tidal ventilation, which is delivered with the pressure control ventilation profile. Let's have a look. So we go into the additional settings and we go into the volume guarantee. So are we, okay, our volume target, we have a 2 kg baby. So our volume target, let's say if we aim for five milliliters, our volume target will be about 10 milliliters per kilogram, no, sorry, 10 milliliters of the tiny volume. So I activate the 10 milliliters, I activate on, and what do we suddenly see? Interestingly enough, we no longer have the inspiratory pressure. 
but we rather have the time involved. And this is a new parameter that we have to keep in mind. And you see now that we have the time volume, we have perfect uh, time ventilation per kilogram of body weight. And now let's imagine, let's imagine the situation. We delivered the perfectant and our patient has been better for a while, but unfortunately the patient condition changed. And again, we uh, the compliance went down. So our lung compliance went down. And what happens? What happens to our inspiratory pressure? We were at about 20 millibar, and we are now went to the 30 millibar. How did the how is that possible? Why is our inspiratory pressure increased? Because we are in the volume guarantee ventilation. When we're in volume guarantee ventilation, we have the volume targets and the ventilator would, inc would maintain this volume target and it would automatically increase the pressure. In, in our case, we have Pmax of 40. So let's imagine that we had a Pmax of 30. So what would happen? We try to increase our pressure. And uh, because we have a volume target of 10 milliliters, the ventilator would automatically adjust the pressure. And if we look at the trend, and I would like to show you the trends measured. So what we notice here, if you have the trends for the inspiratory pressure, we have relatively stable pressure, then what happens? We in have an increase in pressure because we were trying to deliver the tidal volume. Then we activated the volume guarantee and our lung compliance decreased. So now let's have a look. Let's have a look at the PIP and we decided to again deliver the surfactant. So we deliver the surfactant and pay attention to the inspiration pressure and pay attention to the tidal volume. So we delivered the surfactants and there is an immediate increase of the tidal volume, obviously because the compliance, uh, compliance improved, but look at the inspiratory pressure. It is automatically being reduced. So we no longer need the uh, manual adjustment of the inspiratory pressure to ensure that we are ventilating our patients within the same volume target. The machine does that for you. So we delivered the surfactant and we now ventilating our patient at 18 millibar. What is the trick here? The trick here is to optimize your alarm limits because we need to ensure that if the patient condition changes, we recognize that. And the PMAX setting usually sets to five to seven millibar above the current working pressure. So I'm gonna set it up at about 24 millibar. So what happens again? I mean, obviously the baby's compliance doesn't change so frequently, but what happens now if our compliance has reduced again? So our compliance reduced and the ventilator is trying to increase the pressure so we reach the maximum pressure of Pmax 24, and then we get the alarm. Tidal volume low alarm. Why is that? Because our target tidal volume is 10 milliliters, but our delivered or measured and expiratory tidal volume is only 8 milliliters. And we cannot go higher with our pressure because we have the PMAX settings. And now, if you look at the alarms, I mean, I receive this question almost on a weekly basis. Your ventilator cannot ventilate, it cannot reach the tidal bowl. And for this, we have a very, uh, a very good, uh, we could the we have very interesting. 
Okay, so we're gonna have a look at why do we have this information. So we press on the alarm bar, and what I'm trying to do, there is a yellow alarm to try the volume low. And if I don't know why this yellow alarm might happen, I can press on this information bar. And because the applied high volume has less than 90% of the set value for more than five consecutive breaths or eight consecutive breaths of the same time. The pressure for a breath is limited by the set P airway high alarm limit or by P max. The set tidal volume could not be delivered. I think that is an excellent explanation. So now you know why you have the tidal volume uh, low alarm. So, and the remedy, the first one is check the ventilation settings. The second one is check the patient condition. And only the last one, when we check your patient and when we check your ventilation parameters, the ventilator suggests to adjust the P airway time alarm. And that is exactly how we want to troubleshoot when it comes to uh, volume targeted pressure limited ventilation. Do not press on the P max. If you have a tidal volume low alarm, that means patient condition has changed. That means most likely either there is an issue with the compliance of the lung or there is an issue with an obstruction of the ET tube. One of the two. And that you will also see on the curve. So if we have something like this, so you see what happens to the flow curve? You see what happens to the flow curve? If you have the information with the tidal volume low, and if your flow curve is flattened to this level, if it was normal and if it flattened to this level, that is most likely the issue with the obstruction. We need to perform the suctioning. Once the suctioning is performed, we are back to normal flow curve. So as I said, all of the answers are lying within the parameters. So uh, that is so much for the volume targeted ventilation. And I think we spent quite a bit of time on the SIMB. And I think SIMB makes perfect sense. I'm going back to the uh, waveform and we'll let you the volume again. So SIMB makes perfect sense. We have now SIMB with volume guarantee. So uh, what happens if the patient starts to breathe spontaneously? So our patient is breathing spontaneously and basically you see that we can synchronize. That was a great example. So the patient starts to breathe spontaneously. This is patient triggered breath. How do I know? Because there is a little lung symbol. However, there is a breath of the different color. So we have dark blue breath and we have the light blue breath. What is the difference? The difference is in the nature of the breath. In SIMB, we have the mandatory breath and we have one mandatory breath per cycle. How do we calculate a breath cycle? We take one minute divided by the respiratory rate. So in our case, we have about one second roughly plus nine uh, of the breath cycle. So there will be one mechanical breath like that uh, per breath cycle. Anything in between that is spontaneous, that, that, that the patient triggers is going to be considered as spontaneous activity. And let me, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to increase the Emacs a little bit high for the purpose of demonstration. So we're going to go back to normal. We're going to review, we're going to remove the time volume alarm. So, um, okay, so I would say, so our patient starts to breathe spontaneously and you see we have a bunch of, great example again. So we have, wait, let me try again. Perfect. So we have a mandatory breath that is delivered with about 10 milliliters 
Then we have a spontaneous breath with no support, and it which translates in about uh, two milliliters. So we have extremely high variability. And remember that our patient is breathing through the ET tube. Okay, and if a two kilogram baby, probably we would have about 3.5 milliliters or 3.2, 3.5 millimeters uh, the ET tube. In the extremely preterm infants, we have as small as 2.5 millimeters. So we have extremely high resistance through the ET tube. And if you ever try, I mean, obviously, if you go out and if you try to breathe through a straw, even for a few breaths, we as healthy adults, we experience uh, excessive work of breathing. So now imagine a premature infant with underdeveloped respiratory system that is trying to breathe without any support through the tube. Very difficult. So what we can do, we can activate the pressure support. So we can activate the pressure support in order to compensate for the excessive work of breathing through the narrow AT tube. So let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look how it's going to look now. You see, that actually looks a bit better. Let me try to simulate it a little bit better. Okay, so here. So we ventilate our patient at uh, inspiratory pressure of about uh, 29, and then we provide a little bit of support to our PIP is 7, our pressure support is 5. So here we are at about 12 millibar, and that translates in a certain type of volume. I'm just going to reduce the respiratory rate for the purpose of demonstration to have a longer breath cycle for spontaneous breathing. So now you see, this is a great example. So I have a mix of mandatory breath and then I have the spontaneous breath that are pressure supported. And look at the tidal volume variation. On mandatory breath, we have a great tidal volume of 11 milliliters. And then on the spontaneous breath, we have only four milliliters. So again, extreme variability, quite unstable ventilation. What we can do, we can potentially increase the uh, pressure support and see, okay, now it's a little bit better. So the variation is still there, but certain variability we can allow for our patient. Right? So is there an alternative to this? Because now we have to think of the tidal volume. We have to think of the tidal volume target per kilogram of body weight. We have to think of feet. I'm going to reduce again for the purpose of demonstration. And we have to think of the pressure support. It's a lot of parameters to think of when it comes to mechanical ventilation. Is there an alternative? And the answer is yes, there is an alternative. And the alternative is called pressure controlled assist control ventilation. So let's have a look. Between the two ventilation settings, they are pretty much the same. If I activate now, from the first look, they are also pretty much the same. What is the difference here? The difference here is that now, every patient's breath is supported, and I'm going to switch off the volume guarantee for the time being. Um, so every patient breath is supported to the same level. So there is the same tidal volume that is delivered to the patients. There is the same pressure level that is delivered to the patients. So it is more stable ventilation and there is no excessive work of breathing through the narrow ET tube because every single breath is now supported to the same level. And that is already a big advantage because we are offering 
um, a certain stability and we are removing this ET tube from the equation. So, um, and that's when it gets quite interesting. If we follow, if we would like to win our patients, so our patient is growing bigger and we want to win our patients. So in SIMV, what we could do and what we traditionally do is we win by reducing the respiratory rate. So we reduce the respiratory rate to about 30 to allow for a longer period, for longer breath cycles, to allow the patient to have certain level of spontaneous breathing, right? So we mix the mandatory breath with the pressure supported breath. And in order now to win our patients, we would need to reduce the inspiratory pressure. So we now gradually reduce our inspiratory pressure. We see if the patient can still generate 10 milliliters, we still can, so we reduce further, we reduce further. Okay, still looking okay, so we reduce further. And basically, weaning takes a long period of time. And we can as well help you automate weaning by activating again volume guarantee. So I activate volume guarantee. And what will you see? What will you see? So we are now on the PIP of 22 millibar, and we are delivering approximately 10 milliliters. So now, Let's see, the patient is very strong. So the patient can breathe very strongly and pay attention to what happens to our PIP. PIP is actually going down. Why is that? Because the patient, and if you look at the tidal volume, Patient is able to wean himself off and to wean his pressure to the level of peak. So all the mandatory breath, the patient can generate enough tight volume. So now the problem is this pressure supported breath. Look, this breath. So the mandatory breath is now down to peak level because the patient, the volume guarantee wean the patient off. But the pressure supported breath, the spontaneous breath, is still supported to 10 millibar. So now we need to gradually reduce the pressure support and see how it goes. There's still variability of breath. Okay, so we decide to reduce the pressure support even further. And we now see, okay, this patient is ready for excavation, but we still needed to change the parameter. How does weaning in pressure control assist control ventilation works? Volume guarantee. So we see that our patient starts to breathe spontaneously. How do we know? Let me just go back. So, so. so we are now back to where we started from. Patient breath is supported, and now patient starting to breathe stronger. Pay attention to the PIP. What happens to the peak in spiritual pressure? It is reducing and if our patient is now breathing spontaneously you see that every single breath is now of the same level and if you now look at the pressure what would you think about it would you think that your ventilator is not working no because our patients, and I'm going to freeze the waveform, 
generates enough time and volume to weave himself off gradually to the level of people. So this patience is actually ready for meaning. And this is another, um, another way of interpreting the pressure curve. If you see something like that, it, is, it doesn't mean that the ventilator is broken. It actually means that the patient is strong enough and he can win himself off the ventilator by just being in pressure control, assist control ventilation with volume guarantee. And um, that's pretty much the basics that I wanted to cover today. I mean, we did talk about the flow versus the slope. We did talk about the pressure control ventilation and volume targeted ventilation. We did talk about the optimization of the working with graphs. So basically, how can we optimize and how can we optimize our ventilation without changing of any settings by just looking at the curves? We looked at the difference between the SIMB and assist control ventilation, and we looked at the winning. I think it's quite a lot to cover in such a short period of time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to now switch to the questions and answers and um, if you have any questions, please, um, uh, please type them in into your questions box. So um, we have covered the mechanical ventilation, and I think uh, while you're typing in your current questions, we would like to answer the previous questions. Linda, there was a question for you previously. Um, thank you very much for the detailed presentation. I would very much love to see how the forehand suctioning is done. Thank you. Do you have any examples or experience on how the two a forehand uh, um, suctioning can be done? So, um, Marguerite, I'll try and see if I can get it filmed somewhere and I will try and give it at the next um, lecture in July. Um, and it, if, Ness, if we can, I can share it and Katya can put it in the, or you can put it in the newsletter. I'll try and get hold of it. It's not a problem. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and there is another question. Can you please clarify if previous less than 28 weeks should be nursed side to side for the first week of life to reduce intracranial pressure? Thanks. So <clears throat> we will cover that extensively in the neuro um, block, but yes, not the first week. It only needs to be nursed on its side for 72 hours. Um, which is basically three days, I think. Um, and then from there, the brain matter is stable. The, the big problem with um, raised intracranial pressure is that remember, in the first two weeks of life, irrespective of gestation, we have white matter. And then as the baby matures, the brain matter matures. So you should not see intraventricular hemorrhages beyond 14 days. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, okay. Um, the, another question. On the flow waveform, sometimes there is a light blue spontaneous infrared part of the waveform. But the corresponding expert to flow waveform is dark blue, suggesting it is mandatory. I think, um, yes, I agree. Sometimes this can happen. And um, sometimes, when the, especially that happens during the hands on demonstration on the patients, um, it doesn't happen as often because during the demonstration, I try to simulate um, as many breaths as possible. And when I do that, the machine does not have the time to recognize whether the breath has been spontaneous uh, or the mandatory. 
and introduce the limitation when it comes to the high respiratory rate. In the normal patients, you would barely see this, and in clinical practice, I also um, have not um, really seen this. So um, let me try to stimu stimulate this, if I can see if I can. Yeah, I know why also, because when I um, simulate, I sometimes, because I'm pushing on the lung, I'm pressing on the lung, and then I sometimes might push it back in to start the exhalation. So it's really the matter of me doing the presentation and the matter of doing the active inspiration and active expiration. So I think that's pretty much the only visible uh, explanation. Um, okay, so another question is, uh, please, can you suggest innovative ways of preventing the neoflow sensor from uh, beginning water loss? That is an excellent question, and I don't think I have addressed this at all. So I'm going to demonstrate this to you right now. Sorry, I have to I keep blocking the view. Uh, so if we look at our flow sensor, Yes, so this is basically the flow sensor. And um, the, the flow sensor technology that we are using is called hot wire thermometry. So we have extremely thin, extremely uh, tiny wires that are being uh, warmed up or heated up to 400 degrees. And there is a little barrier that uh, prevents one of the wires from heating on the inspiratory cycle and there is no barrier on the expiratory cycle so that's how we can distinguish between the inspiratory flow and the expiratory flow and of course the challenge is that when we um, have such small wires it's very easy to damage the flow sensor and um, our recommendation is of course to reprocess the flow sensor according to the recommendation allow the flow sensor to um, uh, dry completely before reinserting it into the uh, operation. During nebulization, we recommend to disconnect the flow sensor in order to prevent of the small particles blocking the flow sensor. So that is one of the uh, disadvantages, but during the nebulization, we recommend disconnecting the flow sensor. And also, when you, um, let me try to switch the menu. So when you work with the ventilator setup, we, what we would like to ensure, let me just show it to you. So normally you would have the ventilator, you would have the patient incubator, you would have your e e circuit inside the patient incubator. And in this case, um, we don't uh, we don't have the water trap because we have the dual heated circuit. But if you have a water trap, if you have a circuit with a water trap, make sure that the water trap is always in the vertical position to avoid the condensation on the expert relief and the water flowing back into the flow center because the water will damage the flow center. Therefore, um, obviously, if you can. Well, use the dual heated circuit. So we have the inspiratory heated and the expiratory heated. So we can reduce the condensation and we can reduce the uh, risk of water flowing back into the flow sensor. That's uh, damaging the flow sensor. So to be honest, I don't think there are any innovative uh, ways of protecting the flow sensor. We just have to be very careful and especially during reprocessing allow enough time for the flow sensor to dry. The flow sensor needs to dry for at least 30 minutes, but then up to an hour to ensure proper operations. And also um, we have a reprocessing manual, which we could also share uh, as a part of the post webinar communication. And uh, there we outline on the best way on how to clean the flow sensor to avoid the flow sensor damage. I hope that answered your question. Uh, okay, so um, 
the question does the flow center ride 50 400 degrees all the time or only during calibration the adult plant uh, flow center only fits 160 degrees with the second layer of angular temperature yes you are absolutely right so the flow center warms up to 400 degrees during the calibration during normal operation it is also uh, similar to the adult flow center because the technology is similar and but therefore how uh, we distinguish between the uh, um inspiratory and expiratory flow is that by the difference of the uh, uh, hot wire temperatures. Okay, there is another question. I have encountered, uh, Linda, I forgot to ask you, do you have this issue of with the flow center um, or do you have any particular strategies how you can protect the flow center in the NICU? I think I think what you've said is very, very important and making sure the trap is um, is the, in the correct position and making sure that you empty that trap, trap fairly often. What you often find is that the more ventilators and incubators you run in the unit, the ambient temperature rises and for some strange reason it starts affecting quite a bit of the equipment. Um, also, just to make people aware, humidification is essential and important, but be careful of overheating with humidification because that too can cause lung damage. A lot of people run their temperatures far too high and then you get what we call rain out quite easily. Exactly. Thank you, Linda, for this um, feedback. There is another very interesting question which I forgot to uh, mention, and I'm glad that this question came in. I have encountered a few times of the flow center alarm in the PCAC mode compared to PCSI and B mode. And there is anything that we should take note on ventilator settings. So um, I think here, and let me switch to the menu, um, I think here what we need to uh, uh, what we need to remember that um, when we are in pressure control, assist control ventilation, we see that every single breath, and I'm trying to uh, go back to normal operation, every single breath is now supported. And what you can see, because we have sometimes, if the baby is hyperventilating, we might see the alarm and especially in the assist control ventilation what we need to do we need to have an appropriate alarm settings so if you are targeting about um, i think our current target is 30 breaths per minute and we want to allow for spontaneous breathing so i would probably have the alarm at about 60 and if the patient starts to hyperventilate that means if the patient starts to just generate a lot of uh, breath but not really generating any tidal volume we have to be very careful in the pressure control assist control and activate proper alarm limits so what's very important here is that we in the pressure control assist control ventilation we activate the right alarm limits for the respiratory rate high alarm. I hope that answered the question. Okay, um, another question. What is the ideal humidifier temperature for incubator mode in, in, in ventilation? Um, I think this question is best to be addressed to the humidifier people uh, because um, we, I think it all depends on the ambient environment. It depends on whether you're using the incubator extension or not. It depends on uh, the breathing modes or the ventilation mode of the patients. And um, I think on the fish and phyto humidifier, there is, a, um, th there is a mode for invasive ventilation. And I think the temperature is going up to, if I'm not mistaken, 38 degrees. But again, it depends on whether you have heated circuit, non-heated circuit, uh, if the wire of the heated circuit, circuit is inside 
or like in our case, uh, it's outside the circuit, so it goes around. So there are a lot of um, factors that contribute to the um, to the outcome of the humidification. So um, of course we have this incubator extension. So this can be used, and then the, the temperature zone will be lower because this compartment will be already inside the incubator and the condensation will be lower. So I cannot really say what is the ideal temperature on the humidifier. I think it depends on a lot of components, ventilation modes, uh, ambient environment in the NICU, uh, extension, the circuits. So a lot of things need to be taken into consideration. Okay. Um, uh, and there is another question on the flow center. Um, many customers in Australia are asking for the flow sensor to have a serial number so it can be tracked through the serialization process. Uh, tracking is required by a new standard. Um, that is a great point, and I think we do have serial numbers on the flow sensor, but not for the tracking purposes. This is something that we will definitely consider for the future, for the development and improvement of the flow sensors. And uh, we will see whether this can be implemented because I think um, I completely agree that um, in a lot of cases, and we've seen that in clinical practice, that the flow centers, because there are multiple parts, get lost um, during the reprocessing. So I completely agree that this would be a great standard. So I'll definitely take that as a um, uh, recommendation for improvements to our R&D department. Uh, Okay, so there is another comment. I see that leak compensation is not on, um, and this is very common. Isn't leak compensation is great advantage of regular ventilators? I'm used to it while with being on. That is a great comment. Um, I didn't want to bring it uh, in today because I think the leakage compensation requires a completely different level of uh, discussion about mechanical ventilation. So today I only wanted to focus on really the basics, on how to work with drafts, on how to distinguish between the um, basic ventilation modes, which is SIMB and assist control modes, basically the modes that we um, mostly see in the NICU. And also I wanted to bring up the topic of volume guarantee. Um, I will see if we can have a separate webinar on more advanced ventilation settings, such as leakage compensation, and advanced modes such as mandatory minute ventilation and high frequency ventilation. But thank you for addressing this today. Um, okay, so um, another question can you demonstrate the method of nebulizer setting for a ventilated baby? So I think this is quite simple because we do have um, uh, we do have an integrated uh, possibility an integrated nebulizer, uh, which is not installed in this machine, but uh, basically we can we have the possibility to um, connect the nebulization. We have a nozzle here, so we connect the nozzle of the uh, uh, at the front of the machine, and then we press on the nebulization, and uh, we can basically set up the nebulization either continuous or um, for a, for a certain period of time and then the nebulization will be synchronized with the patient breathing so it will be synchronized with the patient inspiratory um, effort so we can reduce the amount of drug that is being delivered to the patient um okay those were so far all the questions that we have and um if there are no more questions or if you still have any questions on mechanical ventilation you can always reach out to Gregor um and of course we can reach out to Linda when it comes to the pathophysiology of the lung injuries and how to translate the uh, ventilation settings to fit the uh, lung injury. So Linda, thank you very much for the session today. I think it was extremely valuable to look at the different conditions, at the different 
uh, images on how the lung conditions can look to better understand what patient population we can have in our NICU. So thank you again for your great support to our digital neonatal nursing course. Um, if you would like to say a few closing words, um, you are more than welcome. No, I think just thank you, Margarita. And um, um, perhaps just on the leaking, most countries use uncuffed tubes, so you do see a leakage. Um, and very often, smaller tubes, as you said, you know, doctors like placing them, but unfortunately, it is difficult to breathe through a straw. So people should consider um, that because it does stop the leakage or helps with it. But I think the graphs and the way you've put it out today has been phenomenal. So thank you very much. So thank you so much, Linda, and thank you for all our participants who stayed with us for the past three hours. At the end of this webinar, there will be a survey. So please uh, fill in the survey, please share your feedback. We would be happy to hear your feedback and learn more about your demands. The next session is scheduled for July 6th, if I'm not mistaken, and we're going to talk about the cardiovascular system. The webinar is recorded. The recording will be shared once it's uploaded on YouTube. And once again, thank you very much for dialing in today to the neonatal nursing course. And I would like to wish you a great day ahead and a great week ahead. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.